Welcome back to the show today. We are talking about NBA general managers and what the good ones do and how much of a team's success should be attributed to the front office. The front office is really what I mean when I say general manager. People throw around the term GM all the time when a lot of times the person in charge of personnel has a different title. Daryl Morey, the longtime general manager of the Houston Rockets, is now the president of basketball operations at the 76ers. Elton Brand is the general manager of the 76ers. I don't believe that Elton Brand has been responsible for signing or trading any players since Daryl Morey got there. Put it this way, last offseason, James Harden wasn't calling Elton Brand a liar. So in an organization, usually there's one executive that gets credit for the success or is responsible for the failure of the team. And that is who we are talking about today. So let's start with this year's executive of the year, Brad Stevens. Oh, and that's another thing I want to bring up. There is an executive of the year award. And the executive that always wins is the executive in charge of the roster. It's not the executive that's looking through the applicants of equipment managers on Indeed. So Brad Stevens hasn't always been successful, has he? Well, actually, never mind. He kind of has. Because before Brad Stevens managed the Boston Celtics, Celtics, he actually coached them. And in his eight-year tenure, he was a good coach. He only missed the playoffs once, and that was in his first season, and he got to the Eastern Conference Finals twice. But the problem is, in the NBA and in most professional sports, even if you're good for a long time, you can still be fired because you weren't great for at least one or two years. Take a look at Mike Budenholzer and Frank Vogel. Both those dudes got fired two years after they won a championship. Danny Ainge was president of basketball operations while Brad Stevens was the coach of the Boston Celtics. Ainge had been there since 2003, and he hadn't won a championship since 2008. Things were getting stale in Boston, so Ainge retired. He didn't really retire, though. He does the same job with Utah Jazz now. And Ainge appointed Brad Stevens as his predecessor, which is something I guess they let him do. This happens a lot. You got a coach with a lot of talent and passion, but you can't keep doing the same shit over and over again. So you say to your head coach, hey, we're gonna fire you. But perhaps you might be interested in an executive role in the organization. That way, instead of being publicly fired and banished from the practice facility, you can stick around and just move to a different office and have a slightly less cool job. This happens quite a bit. It just happened to Steve Clifford, who was the Hornets head coach. He now works in their front office. It happened with Dwayne Casey and the Pistons two years ago. It's like when you break up with someone, but you recognize that they do provide some value to your life. So you see if they'll stick around as a friend. I know I've said that before, but I'm very proud of that simile. So it's a good thing that Brad Stevens stuck around with the Celtics as an FWB because he is way better at being a president of basketball operations than he is a coach. And he's pretty damn good as a coach. So let's talk about some of his big moves. Let's start with the Derek White trade. A lot of you probably don't even know what team Derek White was on before he went to the Boston Celtics. Derek White was kind of just a dude on the spur. He was one of those guys that you might hear a random podcaster say that they like his game or something. But there were no Derek White stands like there are now. Brad Stevens saw something in Derek White. He had to give up Romeo Langford and Josh Richardson. A first round pick and a pick swap. People at the time criticized Stevens' decision. They said, hey, Richardson's a better shooter than Derek White. He's a better defender. Why are you giving up Romeo Langford? That's our wing depth. Not to mention all this draft capital we're giving away. But it didn't take long for Derek White to prove himself as a smart decision for a trade. During White's first two full seasons as a Boston Celtic, he was an all-defensive player. And then he won a championship. Now, White just got called up for the USA Olympic team. So in my head, this is something Brad Stevens could only come up with if he was actually watching Derek White take. Because if you look at his stats on paper when he was with the Spurs, they're not special. His shooting stats were below average and he was coming from a team with a losing record. But Brad Stevens knew that sometimes stats don't tell the whole story. Another decision that I really respect respect is him suspending Ime Adoka. Ime Adoka had an inappropriate relationship with a female staff member. That's all anyone knew. But Brad Stevens knew the whole story and he immediately suspended Ime because he broke company policy. Which had to be hard because Ime had just taken the Celtics to the finals as a first time head coach. It would have been easy to just kind of sweep it under the rug and see if it goes away. But if you know anything about public relations, you know that a cover up is worse than a crime. I also like that he stood up for the woman that was involved. Obviously Celtics fans weren't stoked that their head coach was being suspended. So they took to Twitter to kind of speculate on how this woman brought this situation on herself because there was no way that sweet little Ime would ever abuse his power in the organization. So Brad Stevens expressed his dismay about this speculation, letting all the female staff members know that he supported them in situations like this. You may think, well, this is an obvious move for any figurehead in an organization, but you'd be wrong because Josh Primo in 2022 exposed himself to a female psychologist for the team. He did it nine times. There 
nine separate occasions, and this woman reported it every time. And the Spurs did nothing. No one cared. Until the woman filed a civil suit against the Spurs and Prima. So I think Brad Stevens getting out in front of the situation took a lot of courage. Now, back to the basketball related achievements. I like Stevens' decision to reward Joe Missoula with a full time head coaching job. Missoula was the interim head coach after Adoka had been fired. But midway through the season, the Celtics had the best record in the league. So Stevens promoted him. Missoula got a lot of unfair scrutiny during his first playoffs as a coach, even though he made the Eastern Conference Finals as a first time head coach. It's hard to do. And now he's a champion, so you can't say, oh, they should have waited till Ime wasn't suspended anymore. That was not the move, dude. Another sneaky trade, just like the Derek White trade, was the Porzingis trade. Stevens dealt Marcus Smart, who by my understanding is a Boston crowd favorite and a defensive player of the year, for a guy who had become irrelevant in the league and was known for his injuries, and was like 7'4 and didn't want to play center. But Stevens had noticed that Porzingis was coming off the best season of his career in Washington. Brad Stevens had to be the only person watching Wizards games. Also, Marcus Smart wasn't really fitting in with Tatum and Brown. He still fancied himself the elder statesman of the team. He wanted the shot at the end of games. He was not on the same page as the rest of the team. So, I respect the cold-hearted move of shipping out the heart and soul of your team. And you may have forgotten that not only did the Boston Celtics get Kristaps Porzingis, they got two first-round picks out of that deal. It's crazy, right? And my personal favorite, the Drew Holiday trade. The Bucks gave up Drew for Dane. And Drew was just sitting around in Portland getting ready to be dealt. Drew's stock was very low, considering the Bucks' first-round exit in 2023. The consensus being that Drew did not have the offensive firepower to support Giannis. So all the Celtics had to give up were Malcolm Brogdon, Rob Williams, and two first-round picks. Two guys that you could not depend on to stay on the court. So speaking of Rob Williams and going back to Marcus Smart, I believe that devaluing the sentimentality that Boston fans had for these players led to them winning a championship. I respect the sort of ruthless management style. It's something that the Lakers don't do. One thing the Lakers take pride in is taking care of their star, which translates to paying them too much money at the end of their careers in hopes of incentivizing more stars to sign with them so that they too can feel respected while riding out the last few years of their career on a mediocre team. Kobe Bryant's last contract was a massive overpay given his output. And the same thing is going to happen to LeBron. I think they're leaning even more into their star brand right now. Their main focus is to keep LeBron James as a Laker until he retires. Their focus is not winning and it's not rebuilding. It's pleasing LeBron James. They traded for AD. They traded for Russ. They traded away Russ. They fired Vogel. They fired Ham. They hired JJ Redick, LeBron's podcast co-host. They drafted Bronny James in the second round and then gave him a three-year fully guaranteed deal. These are not logical basketball moves that people make. I'm not saying they're stupid. I'm not saying they're foolish. All I'm saying is they are not Rob Palinka's first idea. They're LeBron's, right? But I don't really know what the Lakers' goal is. I'm assuming that every general manager's short-term or long-term goal is to win championships. Well, maybe it's not for the Lakers. Maybe the Lakers' goal is to grow their brand and see how many notable players they can get in purple and gold. But that is not the way that Brad Stevens operates. I've got a feeling that Brad Stevens would straight up trade Jason Tatum for SGA if the Oklahoma City Thunder offered it up, right? Now, I wanted to do a little more than Brad Stevens glazing on this video. So Let's talk about a general manager who mismanaged his organization and got canned. We're talking Troy Weaver, formerly of the Detroit Pistons. Troy Weaver desperately wanted to hire Monty Williams as the head coach of the Detroit Pistons. Which I have to say, yeah, that seems like a pretty smart move. Monty Williams had been hastily fired from the Suns. The dude had taken them from being one of the worst teams in the West to the finals in 2021. So I can understand Troy Weaver's thought process thinking, hey, maybe he can turn our team around too. The problem was, Monty didn't want to coach the Pistons. Matter of fact, he didn't want to coach any team at all. His wife had recently been diagnosed with cancer and he wanted to take some time off just to be with her. But Troy Weaver made him an offer he couldn't refuse. He offered him $78 million for a six-year contract. That's all guaranteed too. No options. And that contract would make him the highest paid coach in NBA history. And that is why Monty Williams decided that he wanted to take the deal and be the coach of the Detroit Pistons. It wasn't his passion for coaching. It wasn't the opportunity to take a struggling franchise and return it to its former glory. It was the historically large paycheck. And I'm not assuming that. He said it, literally said it. The money. I mean, that's something that people don't talk about. They always say it wasn't the money. I always laugh at that. I think that's disrespectful. Um, when somebody is that generous to pay me that kind of money, 
Dude, that is not what you want to hear if you're an owner. The word generous should never be used in the context of someone's compensation for their work. This isn't a donation to a charity. Monty Williams continued to show his apathy towards being the head coach of the Pistons. The Detroit Pistons hit a franchise record low wins with 14 in the entire season. They tied the longest losing streak in NBA history with 28 consecutive losses. And he wasn't even playing the developing players either. He was playing Killian Hayes over Jaden Ivey. He was playing Evan Fournier and Bogdan Bogdanovich. Two veteran players who were not a part of the Pistons' future. And he wasn't letting Cade Cunningham, Jalen Duran, or Asor Thompson play together. The team was a true nightmare, and Monty Williams was fired after one season on a six-year contract, settling a buyout at $65 million. So Monty Williams is not the loser in this scenario. He's still getting paid from the Suns contract buyout. In the last two years, Monty Williams has been paid $85 million to not coach NBA teams. So Troy Weaver was fired two weeks before Monty Williams was fired from the Pistons. Interestingly enough, he has been hired as a senior advisor with the Washington Wizards. Which sounds about right, doesn't it? All right, thank you for being here. I know I left a lot of meat on the bones, so if I'm gonna do another video on general managers. Let me know what I missed, what I should do. If you leave a comment, I'll always reply, like or dislike the video, and be good to your mothers, eat a corn dog, and talk to a friend about basketball. Yeah.